Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today entitled, How Do You Risk Stratify Bipolar 1 and Bipolar 2 Depression? I'm Dr. Joseph Goldberg. I'm a clinical professor of psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. I'll be walking us through some information today about phenomenology in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder and the depressed phase in particular and some of its implications and then some of the treatment consequences once an accurate diagnosis is made. So let's start with just some clinical comparative points between bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder. Studies have told us a number of characteristics that are useful to clinicians in thinking about differences among bipolar 2 and bipolar 1 depression. Bipolar 2 disorder patients tend to have a longer duration of untreated illness from the inception of symptoms. Maybe that's because in bipolar 2 disorder, your highs may not get noticed as readily as if you have bipolar 1 disorder, where full manias may lead to hospitalization or functional impairment. Bipolar 2, the highs may get mistaken for just euthymic periods. There tend to be more frequent comorbid anxiety disorders or even just symptoms. So anxiety is a common co-occurring phenomenon in people with bipolar disorder, but especially so in bipolar 2. The frequency of depressive episodes and durations of depressions tend to be longer in people with bipolar 2 than bipolar 1 disorder. The age at onset of the illness tends to be somewhat later than in bipolar 2 disorder, uh, than in bipolar 1 disorder, rather. Fewer lifetime hospitalizations. So now this is a little tricky because in, in bipolar 1 disorder, you can certainly get hospitalized for manias or depressions. In bipolar 2 disorder, if hospitalizations occur, they're by virtue of the depressions, not the mania. So it's something of a misnomer to say, oh, that's just bipolar 2 disorder. The, the disability comes from the depression side more so than the high side. Antidepressant use uh, tends to be more frequently prescribed in people with bipolar 2 than bipolar 1 disorder. Frequent episodes, that is rapid cycling, four or more episodes per year seems somewhat more prevalent in bipolar 2 than bipolar 1 disorder. And after a depressive episode, residual depressive symptoms seem to be more persistent and more linked with functional impairment in people with bipolar 2 than bipolar 1 disorder. Now, arguably, one of the greatest forms of morbidity and mortality in, in all of psychiatry really is, is suicide risk. And people with mood disorders are among the highest risk, and people with bipolar disorder are yet further among the highest risk. And in comparisons of bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 disorder, there's actually a bit of a divided literature as to whether or not suicide attempts or completions are meaningfully different in one versus the other. Studies say about a third of people with bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 disorder will have at least one lifetime suicide attempt. Um, whether bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 is higher can vary on the study, but by and large, they're, they're both fairly substantial. It has been shown in some studies that bipolar 2 disorder patients tend to use more violent methods of suicide attempts compared to bipolar 1 patients. More violent methods may implicate greater lethality as a consequence. Um, cognitively, this is sort of an interesting area, people with bipolar 2 disorder who attempt suicide may show greater deficits in executive functioning compared to bipolar 1 suicide attempters. What, what's the relevance of that? Well, executive functioning is planning and organizing and reasoning through. And um, while it is true in many instances, suicide attempts are driven more by impulsivity than planning as a general rule. Um, when one is sort of thinking through consequences or, or issues around feeling hopeless or, or the ability to problem solve, th that relies very heavily on executive functioning. And if that is compromised more so in bipolar 2 patients, that, that may be an implication for suicide risk. Um, uh, similar risk factors for suicide attempts in bipolar 1 and 2 patients include sex, presence or absence of rapid cycling, substance use comorbidity, other psychiatric comorbidities, and an early age and onset. So in many ways, BP1 and BP2 are more similar than different vis-a-vis -vis suicide risk. All right, so where are bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 depression more different than similar? One realm here is the use of antidepressants. So while people with bipolar disorder in general have not been demonstrated to have an excellent response to antidepressants, say compared to unipolar depressed patients, um, and may have a higher risk for induction of mania or activation symptoms of the antidepressants, that risk may stratify. Bipolar 1 disorder patients seem to be about 1.8 times more likely to have a destabilization of mood during antidepressant use as compared to patients with bipolar 2 disorder, which is to say that there may be a somewhat greater margin of safety 
if not efficacy in the use of antidepressants and bipolar II depression. Well, well, what about efficacy? So interestingly enough, there have been a handful of small preliminary randomized controlled trials looking at antidepressant response rates and switch rates with the use of an SSRI such as sertraline or lithium or the combination of two. And this is some interesting data from the Stanley Foundation Bipolar Network, which identified really no difference in the risk of switching from depression to hypomania. These are bipolar two patients. So by definition, nobody gets manic, they can get hypomanic. Uh, if patients receive lithium or sertraline or the combination. And even more interestingly, in terms of treatment response rate over time, here again, there was no clear difference in this particular bipolar two sample in time till response in bipolar two patients receiving lithium, sertraline, or the combination. There was more dropout with the combination, but somewhat contrary to what one might expect, sertraline and lithium had a very similar pattern of efficacy. That's monotherapy in bipolar two, not bipolar one patients. Here's another piece of evidence looking at bipolar two depression and its unique response rates that we see with antidepressants. So uh, about 12, 13 years ago, this is a randomized comparison of lithium alone or fluoxetine alone or placebo in relapse rates for bipolar II depression. Interestingly, this study found that fluoxetine was superior to placebo, uh, but it was also superior to lithium. Lithium was actually not an efficacious preventative strategy for recurrences in bipolar II depression. Now there's a catch to this study. This study was predicated on the initial response in bipolar II depressed patients to fluoxetine alone. Less than half of patients had a robust initial response, and of those enriched patients uh, continuing, remaining on fluoxetine monotherapy had a lower risk for relapse as compared to patients who were randomized to take lithium or placebo. So this study says that a lot depends on initial responsivity, that bipolar II depression may be different than bipolar I depression in terms of antidepressant potential efficacy, that even monotherapy, which is frowned upon in bipolar I depression, may not be as much of a risk for mood destabilization in bipolar two. And lastly, this study does need replication. It's just one trial. So if we move on to some of the FDA approved treatment options for bipolar one and bipolar two depression, um, there's a recent study looking at the drug lumateperone. Here is monotherapy. It's also been studied as augmentation of lithium or valproate. And um, uh, reduction of depression symptoms was statistically significantly greater with lumateperone, 42 milligrams a day, as compared to placebo, both in bipolar one and bipolar two depression. But what's really interesting here is the magnitude of difference, the clinical meaningfulness of the effect was about twice as great in bipolar two than in bipolar one disorder. The drug was efficacious in either subtype, but had an even bigger effect in bipolar two than bipolar one patients. This effect size is a, a decimal, uh, 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 effect size is about 0.5 would be considered a medium effect size. Um, an effect size of 0.8 is a large effect size. So both meaningful, but um, uh, an even bigger effect in bipolar too. By contrast, the only other FDA approved treatment for bipolar two depression is quetiapine, where both bipolar one and bipolar two depression was studied. And um, interestingly enough, here we, we saw the opposite. The magnitude of efficacy, the degree of improvement compared to placebo was more robust in bipolar one than bipolar two depression. And in fact, that difference, bipolar one and bipolar two subtypes, um, what was one of the biggest predictors of differentiation in outcome between quetiapine and placebo. So uh, dose, not so much of a difference, duration of treatment, not so much a difference, sample size, not so much of a difference. Uh, re really the, the biggest effect that was seen was uh, bipolar one depressed patients robust effect in bipolar one disorder. So what can we conclude from these data? Well, morbidity, suicide risk, and functional impairment in bipolar two disorder seems largely comparable to bipolar one disorder, largely based on residual depressive symptoms. There are few randomized pharmacology trials in bipolar two disorder. We've described the two FDA approved treatments for bipolar two depression, lumateperone, and quetiapine, and then a smattering of some smaller proof of concept studies, such as the data we looked at with lithium and fluoxetine or lithium with sertraline as monotherapies or as combinations. So there may be a, a somewhat lesser risk for antidepressant associated polarity switch in bipolar two than bipolar one disorder. And that may imply some greater measure of safety, 
and perhaps efficacy based on these small proof of concept studies that we've talked about, preliminary data. More robust placebo controlled findings uh, with lumetepron and with quetiapine are seen in bipolar two depression. Uh, and, and both of these agents would at the moment represent state of the art evidence-based treatments for bipolar two depression. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you.